So I'm Mike Deline. I'm an engineer working on Google Cloud Platform, and I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about some of the things that makes our cloud stand apart. The common theme you're going to hear today is that we're built on Google. This means that being an engineer on this project is a fun job. To take to having a great global network that will go to the ends of the earth, will go even beyond the ends of the earth, uh, put our lasers, put lasers down, and fiber down with where the sharks are to ensure that we have that, that great global connectivity that so many of our products depend on. So number nine. Let's see if this will advance. Free, fast connections to Google. So when you build on Google's cloud platform, one of the great features you get is the rest of Google. Right, we give you high performance, low latency, high bandwidth, and no charge connection to other Google APIs. Other Google services like Ad Exchange, uh, YouTube, Drive, Docs, Apps, uh, the Maps API. This makes Google a great place to build real-time bidding, a great place to build video processing, where you can do your processing and upload immediately to YouTube, a uh, great place to build productivity apps, interactive apps, uh, collaborate and work with Docs and Drive, a uh, great place to build geolocated services. All right, so there's a wide range of other Google properties and Google services that can make your cloud applications better. Number eight, Google scale. So Google understands scale. And when you build on Google Cloud Platform, you get to take advantage of the technologies we've built that allow us to deliver services at scale. Not to brag, but you know, what you might regard as a success disaster is likely something that we handle every day. As an example of this, uh, we ran an experiment where we took, uh, set up on, on the cloud platform a bunch of servers. We put a load balancer in front of those servers. And that load balancer is the same infrastructure that we use to, to, to deliver our other services, uh, so it knows how to scale. We then fired up a bunch of clients, and we just had them start blasting at the server um, you know, as hard as they could. Uh, they were delivering a million requests per second. So with no pre-warming, no warning, just turned on the load balancer and st fired up the clients. Within four seconds, those clients were ramped up, they're firing their million requests per second at the server, and the load balancer is handling it. Okay. After about a minute, there is a little bit of an adjustment as things rebalance. That all steadies out. Um, even during that time, you're getting you know, very good throughput. That all steadies out, uh, and by two minutes, things have gotten completely boring. Right, and the requests, you know, a million requests per second just continue on. This entire experiment cost us less, you know, cost less than $10. Uh, that was prior to the price drop, so it cost even less today. Uh, which means that this technology is something that really anyone can have. Now, not everyone needs to handle a million requests per second. In fact, that's fairly unusual to do. The way to think of this is as an insurance policy, at least for most applications. Right? You may not need a million requests per second, but you may not know exactly what you're going to need. And so what you can do is build on Google Cloud Platform and know that the infrastructure is capable of handling whatever you throw at it, whatever your customers throw at you. You've got an underlying infrastructure that knows how to scale. An example of this uh, we saw last year at the Eurovision uh, song competition. Our friends at Scalar worked with Eurovision um, what they wanted, so, so Eurovision, Eurosong, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the most popular television events in the world. Basically, if you don't look at sporting events, sporting events are very big, but then beyond, behind sporting events, this is really right up there. Um, they see about 125 million viewers each year. It's a big event. They decided last year to start an app for a second screen experience. But they faced this problem, right? How many users are they going to get from the app? How much load are they going to get from the app? All right, you've got 125 million viewers. Are you going to see 100,000 users, a million users, 10 million users? It's, it's hard to know ahead of time. Right? You're launching a brand new feature, really hard to predict what's going to happen. So they took advantage of the flexibility of the cloud platform, the scalability of the cloud platform, uh, to deal with the fact that they had uncertainty about what they were going to need to do. Because they're on this platform, they were able to deal with, uh, for example, in one phase of the competition, they saw load spikes of about 5x what they were originally anticipating, and that wasn't really a problem. They could just scale up the extra capacity. It took a couple minutes, and then they're serving 
um, everything that they, that they, they were able to handle that load. By the finals, they were dealing with 50,000 requests per second and serving uh, those requests with a 99 percentile latency of under 35 milliseconds. Right, so really great performance, great scalability, and they're able to successfully deliver this new application. Let's go to number seven. Google's cloud is green. So this might matter to you uh, because you're green too. Uh, and, and you'd like to have a cloud provider that thinks about these things. If nothing else that you don't have to worry about making your data center green. Let Google worry about these things. Let Google worry about keeping, being very efficient and finding resources of energy. Um, green is something that's very deep in our values, and it's something that we've worked on and invested heavily in over time. As an example of that, um, this upper right picture is from the Ivanpah Solar Thermal Plant that just went online earlier this year in the Mojave Desert. Ivanpah is, uh, if I remember right, a 392 megawatt generating plant. So that's enough green energy to power over 100,000 homes or dozens of 10 megawatt data centers. Another example here, uh, this is one of the wind farms that we source our, you know, some of our renewable energy from. And there's a bunch of these, you can go to our website to see, to see more examples of that. It's just another data point. Google as a company has been carbon neutral since 2007. So something that's deep in our values, we think it's very important. But, you know, being green is all well and good, but at the end of the day, some people just have green eye shades. And my argument is that this should matter for, for the accountants as well, right? That, that by putting these types of investments in place, we're able to lower our costs of energy. We're able to insulate ourselves from volatility in energy prices. We're able to insulate ourselves from potential increases in the cost of carbon over time. And so this is the type of thing that has allowed us to reduce our costs and pass those savings on to you, as you saw earlier today, um, as we dropped our prices. Let me give a, a concrete example of how the accountants should love a green cloud um, as, as much as we do. So what this graph shows is the power utilization effectiveness across Google's data centers, across our entire fleet. Shows that year by year, uh, since 2008, the power utilization effectiveness is a measure of data center efficiency. What it measures is to deliver one watt of power to the compute infrastructure how, much, how many watts do you need to actually put into the data center? Right. So in 2013, our, our power utiliza utilization effectiveness, our PUE, was, was 1.12 over the year. That meant that over 88% of the energy that went into a data center actually went to the compute, the storage, and the networks, the things that you actually care about. Less than 12% was spread across cooling, across electrical transformation, across electrical transmission losses, even across keeping the lights on in the data centers. All right, so this is a pretty remarkable achievement. If you, if you look, for example, uh, in, in 2012, that's the last year I've got data, the average across the industry, uh, the PUE was about 1.8. So on average, you know, in, in, in industries, and, and probably you know, those of you that walk into a typical data center, the big crack units are running, this is not too surprising. On average, almost half of the electricity that goes into a data center goes to these other types of overheads. Uh, Google's able to drive that cost down through really long-term investments in building state-of-the-art data centers has been able to drive that down to 1.12, where 88% you know, or better of the energy is actually going to what you, wanna, what you want. Number six, supercharged disks. So physical disk drives really haven't changed much since the late 1950s when they were invented. You've got some spinning platters, you've got an arm that you move back and forth, they're getting bigger, they're not getting much faster. Moore's Law is great for moving and storing electrons, but it doesn't really do much when you need to move a piece of metal to read your data. And as disks have gotten bigger, you get fewer IOs per gigabyte, your data becomes you know, trapped inside of these disks. PD, persistent disk, is the, is the disk drive system, the block drive system that we provide as part of Compute Engine. Instead of relying on directly on this kind of ancient technology uh, on the left, it's built on Colossus and Spanner. Colossus and Spanner are two of the large-scale 
data, data storage systems that we've built inside of Google, right, for storing lots of data, spreading it across a bunch of disks, and reorganizing that data for more efficient access. As an example of, of what you get by moving from the old physical device to our new virtual device, if you take a two terabyte physical hard drive and, and compare it to a two terabyte persistent disk, both of them can get very good sequential read and write bandwidth. If you're not having to move the metal, you can do pretty well. But as soon as you start having to move metal to read your data, to do random reads and random writes, traditional disks really fall down. You can get you know, dozens, you know, maybe 75 read, I, read and write IOPS, whereas on, on PD, with, with this ability to reorganize the data for more efficient access, with this ability to parallelize the access across large numbers of underlying physical devices, you can do eight to 32 times better. All right. Some other advantages of, of our PD device um, virtualizing this, this old technology, you know, first of all, you can, you can move PD between machines easily. Right? So you don't have to pull out the disk and put it somewhere else. You send a command, you hook it up to, to another machine. You can actually simultaneously mount a PD device across multiple virtual machines. So in this example, we've got a web service, a bunch of clients are accessing it, we've got a load balancer that spreads the load across a bunch of compute engine front ends. They're all sharing the same back end, back -end storage right, of all the data that they're actually serving. This is nice because it saves you money. You only have to pay for the data once, to store the data once. And it also can simplify your administration. You do one update, and all your different servers can see that update. You don't have to keep, keep a bunch of copies in sync. Another nice thing about PD is that there's no separate charge for IOs. This goes to the theme of trying to give you a simple model to think about pricing. Right? So we think this makes sense, that when you buy a physical disk drive, you get not just the platters, uh, but you also get the arms. You don't have to buy the arms separately. We're going to do the same thing with PD. When you buy PD, when you rent PD, you get, a, you get the IOs. There's not going to be a separate charge for actually using those arms. Right. This is both simpler for you, um, but it also makes it easier to predict your bills. Right. You don't have to try to figure out, OK, I've got a bunch of web servers. How many IOs per month are they going to do so you can predict what your bill is going to be? Instead, when you buy the PD, you look at the size, it tells you what the price is going to be, and you're done. Finally, just another nice property of PD, and there's a bunch of others you can go, go read more about it, is that it, we get rid of some of the, the limitations of the underlying physical devices. So for example, um, if you've got a big database, you know, you wanna, and, you, and you wanna put you know, 10 terabytes for your database onto a single volume, that's something that we can, that we can accommodate. No problem for us. Number five, consistent performance. Multi-tenancy is hard, right? When you, when you build a shared infrastructure, and you want lots of diverse applications to use that infrastructure, you have this challenge of making sure that one application doesn't interfere with another application. Google has lots of experience dealing with this problem. Right? We've been running multi-tenant data centers for a long time, and we've built up a reservoir of technologies that we use internally and now we can use in our cloud to help provide that type of isolation to give you consistent performance. We've built cluster management systems uh, and schedulers in Borg and Omega that help us provide this type of isolation. Uh, as was just mentioned in the earlier talk, we've been really some of the pioneers in containers and contributed some of those techniques back to the open source community for isolating different groups of Linux processes and giving them consistent performance. We've been pushing the boundaries of software-defined networking and taking advantage of that flexibility to improve the isolation in our clusters and across our clusters. As I mentioned a little bit ago, we've, we've built internally a big collection of shared storage systems, Spanner and Dremel and Colossus. And those systems have been designed to allow different applications to take advantage of a shared service, but get the consistent performance that they need. And then finally, we've just built up, over the time, operational practice and tools. We've got the tools to monitor what's going on, to react when we see something that's not right, and to fix those problems and improve our systems over time. And we've been doing that to get better and better consistency, both internally and now, and now externally. 
We hear over and over from our customers that they value this type of consistency. Um, this is one example of one of the, the quotes, but, but we hear this from a lot of customers all the time, and it's something we take pride in and think is a really important thing to be delivering. As an example of the types of things that we do to improve the consistency of our service, I just wanted to show this, this very recent example. Okay. What this graph on the, on the right shows is what kind of performance do you get for the Cormark benchmark as you spin up two, four, or eight CPU virtual machines on the, on the platform. In the left-hand side of each pair of these is what we've been delivering until recently. These are all, um, uh, these are called violin graphs. This is a violin graph. And so the way to read this is you can look at one of these clusters of points. It says it's four CPUs. And the thickness at any given level is basically a histogram. The number of samples, the number of machines out of, our collect, you know, out of the, the, the benchmarks that we ran that delivered this level of performance. Okay. Ideally, what you'd see would be perfectly flat, thin lines right, for each of the configurations. And you know, we're pretty good if you look at our, our, our kind of recent version of the system. So if, for example, if you look at the four CPU case, the vast majority of the VMs that we spun up had an expected level of performance, but there was a little bit of a tail, and, and every once in a while we got an outlier going one way or the other. This is probably not something you'd notice um, unless you were looking pretty carefully, running a lot of VMs, but it is something that we detected. One of our engineers noticed this and thought this is not okay. Right? We want to have consistent performance. This engineer um, you know, spent several weeks, actually a couple of months, tracking down what was going on, did a bunch of st statistical analysis found out you know, when did you get better than expected performance, when did you get worse than expected performance, tracked it down, found an issue in the scheduler, and was able to provide a better scheduler um, that, and, and that gives us the performance shown on the right. Well, we're very nearly back to that ideal of a perfectly flat, thin line when we spin up these machines. That change has been rolling out to our clusters um, over the last couple of weeks, and we'll continue to roll out over the coming weeks. And so if you've been happy with the consistency of performance that you've seen in the past, it should be getting even better in the future. Now, this may seem like a small thing, right? I mean, the vast majority of the time in the past, it was working just fine. Those tails didn't happen very often, and a lot of people probably wouldn't even notice them. But if you ever try to debug a weird performance anomaly in your system, right, you've got enough problems with your own code without that underlying system shifting underneath you. Or even if you're just trying to do something as simple as predict the number of virtual machines that you need to serve a given level of load, you really want to know what each of those machines is going to deliver. That's something that we value. We've learned how important this is. We've got some great engineers working to make that better and better over time. Number four, security. So this picture um, was taken at one of our data centers a couple years ago. It was posted to Street View. It perhaps tipped our hand a little bit more than we intended about how far, far away we're willing to go, sorry, uh, to, to improve uh, our security. Um, but, but suffice it to say, we take security very seriously. We physically protect our sites with fences, barriers, guards. Uh, we have strict access control. My badge will not get me into a data center. Um, and we have video surveillance uh, with both human monitoring and also programmatic monitoring, programs that actually analyze the video, detect anomalies, and raise alarms so people can have a look and, and, and figure out what more needs to be done. We do automatic encryption at rest uh, across PD, cloud storage, and cloud SQL. Um, this is something that you don't have to configure anything. The data gets encrypted automatically. We provide secure communication uh, with both uh, physical security and encryption across our various networks. We I have a growing list of, of, of certifications kind of attesting to the sorts of things that we're doing. Um, here's, here, here are some of these. Um, but I think just broadly, the thing to understand is that, again, you know, high security is something that Google as a whole depends on. It's part of our values. It's something that we work on all the time. Uh, we intend to lead and drive security for the industry. We depend on it for all of our other products. We provide it in cloud, and we take securing your data as seriously as we take securing our own. Number three, 0 to 138. Okay. So this, this graph is, again, another violin graph, um, in this case, showing the time that it takes to start up VMs that are part of various sizes of clusters. Right, so we start up clusters of 110, 25, 50, 100 VMs. 
Um, and then what the violin graph is showing is the histogram of how long it takes for each individual VM to get started. We run this trial a bunch of times to get a distribution. The histogram shows that. All right. So the first thing that you might notice is that you know, spinning up a single VM is, is fast. Um, looks like the first ones are showing up. You know, typically, one will show up in 21 seconds. In all of our experiments, they showed up between 21, 22, and 23 seconds. All right, so the VMs come very quickly, and that's from the time that we say go until you can SSH into the VM. The second thing you're gonna notice is that spinning up a bunch of VMs doesn't take much longer. So in the case where we kick off 100 VMs, spin them all up at once, um, again, we measure how long until individual VMs arrive, and in this example, you know, some of the VMs are showing up as quickly as, looks like 18 seconds, all of them have arrived in all of our trials in, in 38 seconds. And so you can spin up a bunch of VMs and it comes very quickly. What this lets you do is adjust to changing demands. Right? As, as the, the load on your system changes, the, the resources you're using to serve that load, you can quickly move up to match what you need to do. It was this type of agility that uh, our friends at Scalar used to help Eurovision meet their demands uh, for the Eurosong contest that I talked about earlier, to, earlier today. Per minute. So as, as some of you may know, we have a sister business that sells ads. And you know, a big part of what they need to do to make that business work is microbilling. Right? And so once again, we've taken technology uh, that we've, an institutional experience, and applied it to our cloud to improve our platform. So in particular, we, we, we offer per minute billing with a 10 minute minimum for our compute engine instances. Now, this will both save you money, especially for very short running instances, but any time that you're running an instance and it doesn't take exactly an hour worth of work. So if your work takes a little more or a little less than a certain number of hours, you're gonna save money with this per minute billing. What this graph shows is on the x-axis, the number of hours that a VM runs, on the y-axis, the price that you get, the, the cost that you pay to, to run that VM. And, and as you can see, being able to, to, to get, pay for just what you're using can actually result in some pretty significant savings. Again, this gives you more ability to, one, deal with changes in demand, but also, two, take advantage of our scale. So for example, if you're doing a analysis of a big data set on Compute Engine, so you're spinning up a big Hadoop job, rather than run on you know, 100 machines for an hour, run on 600 machines and get the same answer for the same price in 10 minutes. Finally, uh, number one, if, if per minute billing is, you know, renting our infrastructure by the hour is, by the minute is cool, you know, renting it by the second is even better. And that's effectively what you're doing when you use the BigQuery service. What BigQuery does is it spreads out analysis of your data across hundreds or thousands of machines without, of course, you having to manually shard it. We take care of all that. It allows you to have, use a familiar SQL-like query interface to this data across these massive data sets. This graph shows, this actually comes from the, the Dremel paper that we published a couple years ago to describe a lot of the core techniques inside of BigQuery, inside of Dremel at that time. Uh, and what it shows was that they were able to do an analysis of a trillion row table, doing a top K query across that trillion row table, and by spreading out the analysis of this trillion row table across you know, thousands of nodes, they're able to get their answers in under a minute. Now, of course, we didn't stop working on, big, on, on Dremel uh, when we published the paper. Uh, we've continued to work on this system and giving you new features like the continuous queries uh, that were described earlier today so that you upload data, you can keep streaming up to uploads you know, continuously, and as soon as the data hits BigQuery, you can issue your request, and, 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 and now your queries are gonna return answers reflecting that most recent data. So we developed these technologies as part of Dremel internally. It's a great tool. And you know, we're really happy that now with BigQuery, you have access to this technology as well. So thanks for letting me talk about, about some of the things uh, that make the platform special. Uh, we've been able to bring you some, some neat things so far, things from sharks to scale, uh, consistency to security, uh, from green to, to the rest of Google. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be an engineer on this project because I feel like we're really just getting started. Thank you.